Welcome everybody uh, to this second uh, UK Repair Cafe conference. Actually, we held the first Repair Cafe conference the week before lockdown. How many of you were at that first conference? I know some of you were, but it was a sort of maybe 5-10% of people. But since, since then, there was around about 120, we reckon about 120 Repair Cafes in the, in the UK. Uh, we now, with a collaboration with uh, Phoebe, uh, we reckon there's about 250 to 300 repair cafes. Uh, we're, we're also live streaming, um, so we, we're experimenting with live streaming because we had requests from people from north of England and western Australia to join. Uh, but obviously they don't own a, 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 a jet or something or a helicopter. So, um, so yeah, we're experimenting with live streaming. Uh, we, we understand the live streaming is working, which is the first good point. Uh, uh, we will learn who is on the live stream steam later. So welcome to everybody online as well. Um, so I'm Martin Charter. I'm a professor here at UCA, but I'm also the founder of the Farnham Repair Cafe. And uh, we're, we're based uh, here at University for the Creative Arts. Uh, and I'll leave Mark, who will talk in just a, a couple of minutes, to introduce UCA. Um, and I just probably for time, just like to say welcome. Uh, we've got a series of presentations. And in the afternoon, we've got more hands-on uh, uh, you know, work group discussions to use, utilize everybody's experience and share knowledge, which is all is a good part of the, the whole Repair Cafe movement. Is it a movement? Is it a set of individual issues? Another question. Um, anyway, I'll shut up now and, uh, and I'll pass across to Phoebe to introduce herself and uh, we'll start the official proceedings. Do you want me to do my no, just... Hi everyone, I'm Phoebe, I'm the Director of Repair Café Wales um, and I'm going to be talking to you today in a little bit about the work that we're doing in Wales with our network of repair cafés. Um, we have 117 as of yesterday in our network um, and we've been running for about six years so hopefully have lots of experience that we can share with you um, in terms of what we've been doing in Wales and, and how that can impact the rest of the UK as well. Um, and then I'll touch a little bit on um, the work that the UK Repair Café movement is doing too. Who am I handing over to next? Hi, everybody. Um, the corporate bit. Welcome to UCA. Um, the University of Creative Arts really warmly welcomes you to this conference today. And it's my pleasure, our pleasure, to host this conference um, for numerous reasons and sustainability forms a big part of what we're trying to achieve at the university. So I'm going to talk a bit to you about the university and what we are and what we do um, and I'll touch upon our work around sustainability in that. But I'm not going to take too much of your time. Um, so UCA, the University for the Creative Arts, for those of you who don't know much about us, we're sort of one of the world leaders in creative education. Um, we have four campuses across the UK um, but we have a global reach. We have a campus in China um, and we also deliver education to multiple nations across the globe. Um, our international reach has grown rapidly over the last six years. Um, our international population of students has grown rapidly from hundreds to thousands in that period of time and we're really pleased to be that sort of a global leader in the creative arts. Um, so, as I mentioned, sustainability is really important to us. Um, we've got, we're committed to being carbon neutral by 2030. We've recently received four and a half million pounds grant from the government as part of our decarbonisation of our campuses. So we're moving away from gas-based heating systems to ground source and air source heat pumps as well as um, solar energy. So we're well on our journey to being carbon neutral by 2030. Um, I was just talking to Phoebe about the importance of that to young people and obviously as a university we have a lot of young people studying with us and actually becoming carbon neutral is something that young people are really interested in and therefore it's important to us and it's important to our students that we continue on that journey. Um, 
Talking about the students and talking about the, the types of subjects we teach here, obviously there's a lot of creativity, there's lots of materials being used. If you look at fashion textiles, um, what we want to do is to sort of start moving away and educating our students about sustainability and, and sustainability is being built into our curriculum about the materials that students use and the materials they'll go on to use in their future careers and again Phoebe and I spoke briefly about the um, sort of potential mentality of younger people with single use and the instantaneous way in which they do things and and actually by introducing sustainability into the curriculum particularly for potential fashion designers and makers of clothes and, and, and other creative industries. I think it's really important. It's a, it's a big thing that we have to do as a university and it's one of our responsibilities. Um, so that's a bit about UCA. Welcome to Farnham. Welcome to UCA. Um, it's our absolute pleasure to host you at this conference. Um, I look forward to seeing you around today. I have to disappear back in a minute, but I'm going to be trying to dip in and out of the meetings um, as the conference goes on today. Um, I know that's a fantastic agenda in place for you. Um, I will be at the Repair Cafe tomorrow and there's a sustainability um, festival on in Farnham on Sunday and I'm hoping some people will be able to stay for part of that as well. So once again it is my absolute pleasure to have you here um, and I'm going to pass on to Alan who's the Mayor of the Town. Thank you. So, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Farnham and what a sunny day it is and what a sunny weekend we're expecting. So welcome to the second UK Repair Conference uh, organised by the Centre for Sustainable Design at the University for Creative Arts and welcome to uh, the Repair Cafe Wales. I uh, hope you'll have a uh, lovely time here. It's an honour to have you all here today and I hope you get a chance to walk around Farnham. If you can't do it physically then if you uh, download the app Discover Farnham you can literally walk around Farnham uh, virtually. So if you want to do that that's great. Uh, as the Mayor of Farnham I'm very proud of the success of the Farnham Repair Cafe and this, to celebrate its fantastic uh, milestone this weekend as it reaches the 2000th repair. This achievement is a testament to the dedication and hard work of the dedicated volunteers who've been part of this incredible journey. I extend my heartfelt congratulations to Professor Martin Charter for his outstanding uh, leadership in Farnham and to you all for what you've done and that what you've contributed to the evolution of the Repair Cafe concept across the UK. Repair cafes have become a beacon of change in our communities, fostering sustainability and promoting a more conscious approach to fixing rather than throwing away. They remind us that there's an immense value in repairing and restoring the things we already own rather than disposing of them and adding to the ever-growing waste stream. By extending the lifespan of our belongings, we contribute to reducing our carbon footprint, enhancing the environment and preserving our planet for future generations. Today, I'm looking forward to learning with you as you share lessons learned and best practice from across the country. It's a through collaboration and the exchange of ideas that we can extend the impact of repair cafes nationwide and act as a catalyst uh, for wider environmental change. Each success story and the innovative approach can inspire others to join us and make a real difference building more sustainable and resilient communities, one repair at a time. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you and wish you every success as you create new connections and share practical and new ideas. My theme this year is working together with the community, supporting 
young people. So I'm particularly interested in the workshop uh, and what emerges from the round table on the engagement of youth. And I hope to be there uh, for that workshop this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, and have a good conference. So thank you all for the introductions. Uh, uh, myself and Phoebe are just going to give a bit of a scene setting uh, type of uh, presentations. If we've got time at, at the end of both our presentations, we'll take a couple of uh, questions. But, it, but if not, we can pick that up in the, in the rounds, in the coffees, and the, you know, uh, uh, etc. So, um, so I believe we're in the fifth green wave. We're not in the first wave. We're in the fifth wave. And when I was at the Earth Summit in 1992 in Brazil, there was no conversation over climate change or repair cafes or even a circular economy. So what we've really started to see are the evolution of the agenda and particularly, you know, at a higher level, the importance of sustainable development, but also that uh, aspects of the circular economy fit within the whole concept of uh, uh, sustainable development. Within the concept of circular uh, economy, you have this idea of uh, products within the biological cycles and, and technical cycles. And so this is the idea of uh, circulating those materials, components and products on a, on a wider basis. And in terms of thinking about the products and what sits in the environmental side of repair cafes is products. So we thinking should be thinking about maybe not about waste, but about value. You know, how do we extend the value in products, materials, and components for as long as possible? And repair is a very important part. It's a bit of a small slide, maybe, on here, but repair is, you know, a higher order aspect of of, of this because what we're doing in the repair cafes is extending the life of those products. And generally speaking, from the global surveys we were involved in, uh, we've been involved in three global sur for surveys wearing our research hat, the average uh, you know, of fully completed repairs is about 63%, uh, which is very high, actually, if you really think about it, step back from it. There's still an issue that I know, we, all, we well, a number of us know, about how you measure uh, completed repairs, partial repairs, information given, you know, not repaired. So I think there isn't a universal system out there, and that's part of another another conversation maybe. Uh, but repair is 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 important. And what we see at the policy level is the whole concept of right to repair emerging, and actually originally emerged from the U.S. side of of things, actually from the automotive sector, and then moved into electronics. And now you have uh, at least the words being used within UK policy. Getting to the detail of it is somewhat more difficult, and Chris is going to elaborate on where we are in the UK. But in Europe, they've passed recently a repair directive, so a directive. So it's moving up the policy agenda in Brussels, uh, and part of that approach will be to develop a database of suppliers of repair services. Big question for that is, are our repair cafes going to be sitting within that, that database? But the interesting point there is within that repair directive, that is not being driven by the environment uh, directorates, it's been, uh, been um, driven by the, the justice, uh, you know, uh, in, in a sense for citizens and civil society. So that's where that, that the home, if you like, of that directive is, it's actually out of the people side of things, which is an interesting new development. And interestingly, our friends from Wales uh, are, in my opinion, taking a more proactive approach than in, in, in England at the moment. So uh, we've got the great initiative that, that, uh, that uh, Phoebe leads that sits in, 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 a, in a, a very proactive um, approach within Wales and just... I just picked this up literally two days ago as an example. Uh, you know, uh, Welsh Government are advertising for a policy lead within government on repair and reuse. So again, you know, it, it's starting to bubble up, you know, at a policy level. 
But actually, what's interesting, you know, I did a little bit of thinking on this uh, in relation to something uh, else, was actually, you know, um, the, this broader discussion around circular economy, but what might be circular society? And actually, you know, um, if we think about uh, repair cafes, there it's much more about engaging with citizens itself and self and and people who own their product. So the argument is people bringing in their product, are they a consumer anymore? Have they consumed? So it's actually a very interesting, um, repair cuff is a very interesting example of something that's sitting somewhere between the economy, which includes products, and something around civil society. There are now nearly uh, 2,800 repair cafes in the world, and then from uh, what Phoebe and I have discussed, we reckon about 250 to 300, including Wales, England, Scotland, uh, but, but growing a lot, and, and, and certainly we're seeing, and I think a number of you in the room, that at least we know, we're seeing more new repair cafes start up. It was a sort of, under COVID, it sort of obviously put a, uh, a veil over a lot of activities. Uh, but we now, I think that's seeing that veil uh, removed and all that pent-up activity now starting to come, come forward. Very much European-driven. Um, so it's a very, about 80% is Northern Europe. Um, uh, but US is now picking up. And actually, uh, as I understand it, there's, there's quite a growing uh, number of repair cafes in Australia and New Zealand. We've seen quite an explosive growth over the years. Uh, this starts at 2020, 2020, but we're up to nearly 2,800 now in 2023. And just a couple of points that, you know, we had very, uh, there's only 5% at the previous event, but uh, just picking up a couple of key points from the third survey, global survey that we did with our colleagues in the Netherlands. And this survey uh, amongst repair cafes globally, uh, we undertook in 2019. We had about two, uh, 300 responses to it. Due to the Ministry of Error, we didn't include Belgium. It's not some sort of a strange... Uh, 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 um, uh, what's what's this? Uh, the hitchhikers to the guide, uh, guide to the galaxy joke. We had just an error there. Uh, but they are, they're actually very active groups uh, in, in Belgium. Um, so we got a good sample there. And I, I mean, you know... The, for this group, a lot of the things will just be confirmation of what you know, but I thought it was just useful to pull out a couple of points here. So most repair cafes have a shared purpose and identity. So there's a commonality, you know, of, of what people are trying to do through repair cafes. So there's this sort of shared vision. The, the, the main uh, driver is waste prevention. But also, there is, alongside the environmental goals, social goals are very important. And certainly, that community side, the social side, is an absolutely key part of it. Most repair cafes meet monthly in public buildings of some discretion, discussion. Volunteers range from 4 to 20. You know, visitors and customers, 10 to 30. I mean, these are the averages. You know, but and I, I'm sure most of you will recognise all of these things as confirmation around what, what you're doing. Concentration in Europe, and um, you do have this um, sets of repair cafes being set up in 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 many countries. Uh, almost, I forget what it's called. It's like the the. 90th monkey effect where suddenly a repair cafe happens here another one happens here even though they don't share the knowledge people are picking it up I think actually more from uh, for online etc etc so there is similar models evolving all around the world without people necessarily talking directly to other people so it is something's evolving there they're not necessarily connected but the critical mass in countries is very different and I'll just touch on that in a minute um, it's not then, repair cafes are highly practical. They're not about radical change, generally speaking. Be interested to hear if, uh, it, it, you know, uh, if there are some who are really about radical change, but highly, highly practical. Um, 
limited aspect of a political voice. Most of the repair cafes, because they're highly practical, working in the communities, trying to get the job done, they're not about lobbying um, and campaigning as such. But we know there is an interest in some. But the Repair Cafe International Foundation, that is their prime role now. That is, they're very much involved in the policy discussions, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, particularly in Brussels. So this is, is, is a table from the, um, from the, uh, from the, the survey. And you know, obviously there's differences in the sample sizes here. But you see, particularly in Germany, there is a national network. There's regional activity. In the Netherlands, as the, as the leaders, if you like, a lot of engagement in the national group, less in region. France, about the same involvement at the national and regional level. UK, there is no you know, UK repair cafe network based on repair cafes for repair cafes. There are broader networks around repair and reuse that, that Phoebe, I think, will touch on. Uh, but there is a distinct difference about repair cafes to other parts of the repair movement in that it's a key element of it is, yes, it's about repair, but, but secondly, it's about community as well. So what was surprising uh, to, to, to see here, actually, in re-looking at this, was the... Oh, we've got a new, uh, new delegate here. We were, we're spreading, the, spreading the, the wings of repair cafes. Um, so uh, what was interesting here, it's a small sample from the UK, was saying that there were quite a few repair cafes involved in regional networks. Well, the, I think that did evolve a little bit in the last session where we, I think we saw, start to see a network in Cornwall evol evolving and, and a few other places. Um, but I was, in looking at it again, I didn't get that sense of that regional structures uh, you know, when we did this previously maybe be interested to hear later on about any of these regional structures. Uh, certainly, you know, clearly Wales as a, as, a, as a national and, I guess, within that regional structure. This was a survey that many of you completed, I think, uh, that tried to rank the, the areas of most importance uh, uh, in terms of uh, interest for uh, repair cafes. In looking at this again, it actually is too generic because I think these, this listing depends on what stage of development you are at. So I know for startups, their most important issue is insurance. And I can see people smiling and laughing here. Uh, so I think this is, a very, this, is a, this is an average list, and I think you've got different issues. You know, there are, there are different sets of issues if you're in a startup or five, ten years old, maybe. So, but it's, it's a useful you know, indicator that right at the top of the list, actually interesting, is social value, community, and behavioral change. Um, and then, you know, and we actually see new innovative aspects like 3D printing is down at the, the end uh, of this. And it's still, uh, I know that some repair cafes, including ourselves, are experimenting with 3D printing, but it's a, new, a newer area which, which requires different skills. But I would say definitely, you know, if you were looking and asking that question to a startup or early stage repair cafe, you might have a different sort of ranking there. But it's interesting. So I thought I'd put that in there in that COVID was the big issue that we all had to face within uh, at least the existing repair cafes and uh, you know how did we tackle that well we had some closures uh, we had a lot of closures some that closed for the whole period we had some uh, that uh, adapted when they were able to adapt um, and and some that delayed their plans to launch so just to using us as a, as a metaphor, as an example, we, 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 you know, this was, was us you know, before COVID, small room, very busy. Um, and this is what we ended up doing. We had a bag and tag uh, approach uh, with, and developed a, an online booking system. And, and I know others similarly tried to adapt where they could. And then we moved to at least us as the, as the trustees of Farnham Repair Cafe, 
we actually made our decisions as the trustees rather than what the government was saying to us. So we continue with masks actually for a fair time because we felt, you know, a responsibility to the citizens, to the uh, volunteers and others. And um, that was our decision. We'd made that decision. So we did require people to... And, and I'm sure there were different approaches that were taken. And fortunately for us, we were able to... It, COVID did delay us moving into a larger part of our public space, which is a church. But um, we were able to now move to that. And again, from our point of view, we're now... As, as uh, Alan, um, thank you very much for mentioning it. Uh, we hopefully will, based on our projection, we will hit 2,000 repairs tomorrow, which is uh, an amazing achievement for all the volunteers and the repairers. And we try and measure as much as we can on this. Um, and we're even getting down into much more detailed analysis on the products we hopefully at some stage in the next three to six months, realistically, uh, be able to uh, identify, bring in a Dyson vacuum cleaner from the database, we'll be able to tell, based on previous experience of Dyson vacuum cleaners, I'm picking that as an example, what the most commonly occurring problem was and the solution, so that for new repairers, they'll be able to, you know, be able to in improve their, uh, speed up their activity. We've also got the repair carbon calculator that I think a number of you use. It's being used at least by 100 people or organisations around the world. Um, and then we experimented with 3D printing. Also from our side, and I, and I know a, a number of people that uh, are here today, we also thought it might be a great idea in the sort of greater Surrey area to set up a network to share knowledge between some of some of us who are, have, um, are perhaps uh, uh, further down the line with, with with new startup repair cafes, and we've been setting up a monthly Zoom meeting to share knowledge. And I think that has proven to be quite a a, a useful resource because, as Alan correctly mentioned about repair cafes, it's all about that knowledge sharing, that connections. And that's what hopefully will, uh, that a lot of this today will be about learning for others, sharing knowledge, seeing what worked, what didn't work. And so other sorts of networks like this, uh, uh, I'm sure now exist, uh, but we're finding, and I think, you know, uh, some of the people who've joined, particularly the startups, are finding that a useful resource to see what's been done in the past. So again, it's about building the critical mass. Again, from our side, we had some people from Taiwan uh, visit us a while back and we ended up uh, collaborating with them and they've launched the Southern Taiwan Repair Cafe uh, network and very interesting because it's Taiwan for any of you who know Taiwan the interesting angle there is a lot of their repair uh, cafe activities are based around agricultural equipment so it's make do and mend keeping that agricultural equipment going so it's a slightly different angle than you'd see but you could sort of see it you'd see how it makes sense um, and I'm just using this as an uh, you know as an example others will have had spin-offs I am sure from what they're doing so again repair cafe sit in this sort of interesting space between economy and society um, this is just again forget it says strengths of fun and repair cafe just from the survey I think this is a very interesting wordle that really reflects repair cafes more generally yes they are about repair but they're also about community they're about friendly you know people being friendly and very much the people side of it and that came out of an event we organized with the repair cafe foundation where one of the delegates said aren't repair cafes what communities should look like you know people working together shared aims you know uh, looking to uh, reduce environmental impact and, and support individuals so it's an interesting metaphor and I thought that was an actually interesting point because we sometimes struggle to think about what more sustainable futures might look like but actually repair cafes are actually in my at least my person have been part of that and 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 other initiatives could learn from it but again Repair cafes, as we all know, are very much around, about people, about our volunteers and our repairers. And one of my learnings is just the amazing skills and motivation that is just sitting in our communities. If you can just have that catalyst uh, to do things, to engage people. Um, uh, and it's about happy customers as well. 
um, the, with repaired products. What, again, from our research, we, we found that um, uh, people would come into repair cafes uh, hoping they would get a product repaired and generally speaking coming out of the process of getting a product repaired. But what they didn't realise when they came in was this sense of community and the social element. So when they came out, they got this collective uh, you know, feeling. So just in, in closing here, this is just a very, you know, it, I didn't see this when I started it, when we ran our first two test sessions back in 2013. But I think, and hopefully, you know, as Alan was saying, we're now sort of seen as part of the town. And we were able to get, you know, in the 16 pages in the residence guide for Farnham, we were able to get a couple of pages. And I just leave you with that, the last point there, which is that... Um, uh, we had uh, a guy who brought in a Hornby train that he'd got in a jumble sale 60 years ago. And he, he got that because he wanted to get it repaired to give it to his grandson. So it's this whole issue of the physical repair, but also repairing memories, emotional attachment to products. The, we see this very much on the repair shop on TV. But again, many of us will have experienced that um, we've had people bursting out crying because it's repaired a memory. You know, the grandfather giving the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you all know. So anyway, I'd like to sort of thank you very much uh, for, for, uh, for that. And, and hopefully, oh, sorry, what I should say is there is another online, I, I thought, oh, oh uh, we've got an, an, another uh, uh, online conference going on in... Um, in July with Repair Cafe Con uh, rep uh, the Repair Cafe Foundation where we've got European people uh, Repair Cafes joining and also this is just a call out it's very left field but if any of you uh, have any cricket gear coming through your repair cafes through another project we're looking at where we're looking at repair and refurbishment of cricket gear we are very interested to talk to you um, and my colleague uh, Lillian Maybe just stand up. Uh, if you can't get me, talk to my colleague Lillian. <laughs> so anyway, um, great to see everybody here and looking forward to a very positive day of knowledge and sharing. And um, I'll pass across to Phoebe now. Hi everyone, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are doing in Wales with our network and kind of what we've learnt from developing the network, um, how we support groups and then a little bit about how we're linked in with the rest of the UK. Um, so we started in 2017 with one repair cafe in Cardiff, um, we now have 117 um, in our network, most in Wales, uh, about 104 of them are in Wales. Um, and about 80 of those are actively running events at the moment, so some are kind of in training. We do have some in England as well, um, and we do often support groups in England, so our, the kind of work that we do isn't limited to Wales, we just only get funded for the stuff that we do in Wales. Um, so we exist as an organisation to make it as easy as possible for communities to run their repair cafes, so our aim is to kind of remove any barrier that a group might have when they're starting up, whether that's financial, by providing equipment, um, insurance is always a big one, as, as Martin touched on, um, training, help with recruiting volunteers, whatever that might be, um, so that communities can just get on with the fixing bit that they, they really want to be doing. In terms of kind of how we work, we try and find a balance between standardising as much as possible to make it as easy as possible, so really kind of with the ethos that there's no point reinventing the wheel. We don't need 117 different risk assessments that all look kind of the same, or 117 different volunteer policies, um, while also allowing our repair cafes to remain as autonomous as possible. So we want all of our repair cafes to act in the way that's best for their community, um, while using a standardised risk assessment to make it that much easier. Um, there's some stats here about our impact. So in the last financial year, uh, we repaired at least 6,169 items. I'm saying at least because not everyone gives us their data, um, but most people do. And then we use the Farnham Repair Cafe uh, carbon calculator to get the other, the other stats. In terms of how we support the groups, 
Um, I've touched on a few of the things already, but but pretty much all of our groups get a pat testing machine and um, some form of secondhand tablet or laptop to record data. Um, then we provide them with pat testing courses, certificates for their volunteers um, if they'd like to take an exam. Um, the starter kit, which is our kind of online suite of documents. Again, trying to make sure that there's everything there for groups to make it as easy as possible. Um, so that might be volunteer recruitment documents or posters or pat test labels. Um, insurance is a big one and insurance is one that we know lots and lots of groups struggle with. So we have a network policy which makes it a little bit easier for groups to come under our insurance. Generally, most of our English groups have joined Repair Cafe Wales because of the insurance. That tends to be the biggest pull. Um, and I know that that's one of the tables that we've, we've got running later, so we can talk about that more then. Some of our groups also get things like toolkits, banners, additional um, equipment and things as well, depending on, on the funding. We are really, really big on data. Um, so this is where we kind of toe the line between the, the micro and the macro, I guess. So um, we will do everything down to kind of altering a poster for a group in a village in Wales, all the way up to looking at what that kind of data means in a, in a bigger picture perspective. So we ask all of our visitors when they come in to one of our repair cafes to fill in a repair form, and then all of that data goes into a, a lovely database. What that means for us is that we can um, show our volunteers the impact that they're having. So each repair cafe can look at you know, how many items they fix, what their success rate is, what their um, feedback was, what their most popular item is. It's always a lamp, but what their most popular item is and um, why they're maybe not fixing the items that aren't being fixed. And that's really, really useful, we find, for kind of volunteer engagement because they can see the, the impact that they're having on their community. But also, it's really helpful in a wider network perspective. It helps us with funding. It helps us with um, kind of those wider policy discussions as well. So all of this data goes into the Open Repair Data Alliance, which if you haven't looked at it, I'd really recommend it. They pull some really lovely insights out of data from around the world um, and look at particular products and why, you know, who our re repeat offenders are. Um, so we find this to be a really, really useful resource for the network as well. And then we can look at, you know, we can dig down into things. So our fixed status is about the same as what Martin was saying Farnham's is. We tend to add repairable and fixed together. So we use repairable for the items that you get through the door that might need a spare part or where you've given advice or... Um, you know, it goes away and it can be fixed, but it wasn't fixed there on the day. But generally, we find that fixed category sits around 65%, which is really, really good if you think about all of the things that we're, that we're seeing. This one is the one we find the most interesting for those kind of wider policy discussions. It's why are the things we're fixing, we're not fixing, not being fixed. Um, and this was from last week, so this does vary quite a lot, but as you can kind of see from here, we know that half of the items that we can't fix there's a reason for that. There's something we can do about that. And um, I'm sure that ties into some of the right to repair stuff we'll hear from Chris later. Whilst we've seen huge, huge growth in repair cafes in Wales and in the rest of the UK, um, what we know is that for most people, most citizens, when something breaks, their natural inclination is not to fix it. That is not where people's brain go at the moment. So one of the things that we do at a kind of wider Welsh government level is look at um, behaviour change. How do we get people thinking of repairs, the first step when something breaks, rather than logging onto Amazon? Um, and one of, one of the things that we're experimenting with is high street hubs. Um, this is not just happening in Wales, there's some brilliant examples across the rest of the UK as well. But this is our shop space that we launched in uh, about 18 months ago in Newport. Um, it's a permanent repair cafe at the back there. Um, this was from our launch, so there's not normally lots of bottles of Prosecco, but um, that, was, that was from a launch party. And then it's also a library of things at the front. So um, that's where, for those of you who haven't come across a library of things, where people can borrow items instead of buying them. So the idea that we can share resources in communities. Um, and the thing that we're trying to test here is if you put a repair cafe slap bang on a high street, if you make it open five days a week with regular shop opening hours, can you start to engage those people that maybe wouldn't come along to a pop-up? Can we start getting a little bit more engagement? And also, can repair cafes provide a solution to all of the empty high street shops that we're seeing at the moment? 
In Newport, where this one is based, it's a pretty deprived community. It has the most empty high street shops of any high street in the UK. So we chose a bit pretty challenging place to start this experiment. Um, but I guess what, we're, what we've learned so far, and it's still very early days, is that we see a much higher success rate with fixes. Makes sense, you've got more time, you've got more resource, the items can sit there for a week and be worked on by volunteers. Sometimes that three hours in a pop-up repair cafe just isn't enough time to fix something. So we tend to see about an 85% success rate in Newport um, compared to our, our sort of 60-70% in our pop-ups. Interestingly, we see a lot lower donations, so um, people can drop off their items to the shop space rather than sitting with their fixer. And when we find people dropping off their items, they, they tend to give on average a lot less in donations than we find in our pop-up communities. And I think that's really testament to the community aspect of the pop-up cafes that we see. Um, when people drop off their items, they're not building that relationship with the fixer, they're not um, getting engaged with that fix, there's no sharing of skills. Um, so that's something interesting, I guess, for your community repair cafes is, is that that angle is, is really, really important when we're looking at um, building those relationships and that community aspect. Um, we are opening four more of these spaces across Wales to see kind of what this looks like in different communities. Um, as I say, there's lots around the UK doing this as well. Um, and there's a really lovely relationship developing between repair cafes and Library of Things. Um, so for those of you who haven't looked into Library of Things, I'd, I'd really recommend it. They sit hand in hand very nicely together. As an organisation, we have lots of different areas of strategy that we look at. Um, our main aim has always been and will always be to open as many repair cafes as we can. We want to see one in every community in Wales. Um, and what community looks like is, is something we're getting a bit creative with this year. So we've kind of recently been, our focus is geographic communities, but also we've started to look at kind of schools as a community, universities, workplaces, um, youth engagement is down there. And, and we've touched upon that a little bit this morning already, but trying to get more students and young people engaged so that they can start to learn some of those skills. Um, I won't go through all of this, but some of the other bits that are quite important to us as we grow are um, those repair and reuse hubs, so those permanent spaces. In Wales, um, the government have committed to 80 of those. Um, I'm not sure where that number's come from, but they want to see 80 across the country. Those all look very different. They won't all be repair cafe spaces, but lots of them will. Um, and then that awareness and communication and behaviour change bit we've touched upon. So. I've never met anybody that hates the idea of a repair cafe. It's a very easy sell. You never hear of anyone saying, oh, why would you want one of those? Everyone loves the idea. The issue we find is getting people to know about the idea in the first place. Um, social media, I imagine, is a, is a really powerful tool for us, but there's got to be other ways as well of getting people to convert to that behaviour. So that's a, a strategy we're looking at too. Um, obviously, need to touch upon, upon funding. As Martin's alluded to, Welsh Government are very forward thinking with, with repair and reuse. There is an entire beyond recycling strategy in place as an entire repair and reuse policy team. Um, they provide most of our core funding. Um, so we've been really, really lucky in the support that we've gained and I think that's why we've grown so fast. But I think a, a learning from this has been um, thinking about the other benefits of repair cafes beyond environmental benefits. So we know that there's so many social benefits to repair cafes, skills sharing, um, we get a little bit of funding from intergenerational groups. And I think the learning for, for new repair cafes or growing networks is to think outside the box when it comes to funding. We have funding from social care department. We have um, funding from co-op because of mental health, um, through mental health funding. So, um, yeah, thinking about other, other different causes that you can tap into as well is always really helpful when, when looking for little pots of money. Um, in terms of the wider community repair network, um, there is a, a group developing within the UK. It started in 2020, um, thinking about how we can come together a little bit better. So we've talked a little bit about how in Wales we, we kind of try to standardise things and share ideas and not reinvent the wheel. And there's opportunities to do that across the UK as well. We don't all have to be doing things in the same way. We obviously know that people have different approaches to things and that's... That's absolutely fine, but there is so much benefit in learning from each other. Um, the mission of the group is to strengthen and support grassroots repair in the UK. We can raise the profile of repair far quicker if we're all you know, um, singing from the same hymn sheet and all doing it together. So there are a number of groups involved in this network at the moment. It's fairly informal. We meet fairly regularly. Um, and... 
there is now a, a UK repair map that has just been launched on the website, um, which has far more than Martin and I realised. It has 450, over 450 repair cafes on there in the UK. So it's an even bigger movement than, than we'd perhaps thought. Um, you're welcome to go and add your groups on there if they're not already on there to update your details or to just see that you're already on there. Most of you already will be, I imagine. Um, but what I would, what I would just wanted to finish on is, um, I guess, the power of, of networks and of sharing, sharing ideas. It can be pretty daunting as a, a community starting a repair cafe for starting from scratch. There is probably a repair cafe close to you already that is already doing this. Um, it doesn't have to be a national network. It doesn't have to be a regional network. But buddying up with another repair cafe is such a useful way of getting going, feeling supported, sharing some of those documents and hopefully sharing volunteers as well. Um, so I would really recommend having a look at this map and seeing who's closest to you if you're in those kind of early stages of getting going um, or want to kind of build your network a little bit more. That is an absolute whistle-stop tour of what's going on in the UK and Wales. Um, happy to take questions if we have time. Happy to take questions at lunch if you want to come and grab me, <laughs> if there is anything. But thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of the day. So uh, th thank you very much, Phoebe, and you can see what a great job is, is going on in, in, uh, in, in Wales, but also just the sprouting up of repair cafes seem to be, you know, uh, exponentially, well, not quite exponentially, but a lot of activity. Um, so what I wanted to try and sort of think about uh, was looking at the policy that we mentioned uh, that is evolving in UK and, and Europe. And, and thinking ahead to think about what the, the implications of that repair policy is potentially down the line for repair cafes. Um, there may not be significant implications, but there, but there might be. In trying to find, even with my, my experience from wearing all my different hats, uh, it proved to be quite difficult to find the person who has responsibility for this in DEFRA. But... I always like a challenge, so I found I found the person, and then fortunately, what I found that uh, found that uh, the advisors to Defra was an old colleague um, who I worked with a lot when we did a lot of work on eco design and recycling in the electronics sector, and that colleague is Chris, and Chris is here somewhere. I'm not sure is here, and um, Chris has has. Uh, offered to present a little bit on how he sees as a very experienced person uh, how this agenda is sitting in the UK. So over to Chris. Thanks very much, Martin. You're very kind, and it's, it's a, a great pleasure to be to be here uh, this morning. Um, I've already been educated on a number of matters. Um, I, just to say, I'm here with kind of two hats on. One is is my business hat. I work for a company called Rena. I don't work for government. We do work for government, but I don't speak as a spokesman for government. I must make that very clear. The other one is I kind of have. I'm here also with my eco church hat on. Um, I come from Horsham, and our local church, the church that I go to, the windows are rotting, and uh, they need replacing. They're single glazed. They're going to be replaced with something rather better from the energy perspective. Uh, but that has kind of acted as a an engine for getting involved in more sustainable um, activities as a church as a whole and within our community. So I've been educated this morning that we're, there is a repair cafe in Horsham and possibly some of you have been there even. And, and the repair expert in, in our household is my wife who's just fixed the downstairs toilet. Um, we didn't take it out and take it to a repair cafe, it seemed unwise. Um, oh yeah, so my title slide's missing, but my name's, my name's Chris Robertson. Um, I work for an engineering consultancy business called RENA. The I stands for Italy because it's part of an Italian organisation, in fact, uh, in Leatherhead, as it happens. Uh, and the business is all about supporting industry largely everywhere from design to end of life, in, including operation of, of equipment. And some of these pictures here just give you an indication that most of the things that we deal with are quite large. When, when they arrive at our place for forensic uh, failure analysis, problem solving issues that are often quite broken um, so um, the sorts of things we look at are things like power plants, cables, solar systems, uh, there's an electric, electrical um, uh, distribution system on the left there 
We have analytical equipment, bottom left there's an electron microscope with analysis on it. We look at broken things like um, that's a cross section through a, a, a um, the connection between a chip and a circuit board. Um, we look at uh, failed wind turbines, that's obviously very, very failed. And, um, and we look at much lo uh, uh, but more domestic things as well. I work in the, uh, not in the forensic area, the failure analysis area, but within the regulatory space, which is where I think Martin and I have interacted most over the, the last uh, 20 years or so. And, uh, and we also, and, and as part of that, we work for the Department of Security and Net Zero through Ricardo, who is another engineering consultancy business supporting UK on what it wants to do on what's called eco design policy. Uh, I can't speak about what the UK's intentions are in that area, but um, I can talk about what the regulatory context is at this point. Um, that's one of the pictures off the last, off, off the last um, slide. It's um, out of, uh, I think, a domestic heating system, uh, which got very hot. Uh, you can see the live and the neutral there, and um, maybe there was a, an earth going in there somewhere, but it's long gone now, isn't it? Um, so for a, an organisation in this context, if they came to us and say, well, why did it fail, and what's the consequences of that? Do we need to replace the heating system? Do we need to, um, or was it actually a, a, a slow um, sort of smouldering thing which eventually just tripped out because of the uh, design of the, of the product? Was it designed well? And that has implications in terms of state sustainability in terms of, and also of course of, of safety. Can you lay, leave something until it fails and then fix it? Or do you actually have to uh, do something like a recall, which is a sort of area that we work in. Um, what I'd like to uh, talk about is how product, imp product policy uh, impacts product design and therefore repairability, um, what the UK's is objectives are in that regard to the extent that that's visible um, and how that impacts repairability and where are things heading, which doesn't just take into account the UK or uh, regional developments and it's really exciting to see what's happening in various parts of of, of the of the UK, um, but also wa wider. So there's an energy label on the right. Um, you'll be familiar with those, I'm sure. Uh, the A to G thing, um, most people will probably be aware of, and that A is better and G is worst. Um, what's interesting there is um, <clears throat> this is an energy labelling uh, regulation. Used to be the case in the EU. Now it's part of UK law. Um, but often on the bottom of an energy label, uh, there will be other criteria listed. Um, so things got like, like the washing basket there, that's to do with um, the, the ability of the product to do cleaning, how long it's going to take, there's the clock, there's the amount of water it uses, um, uh, your washing capability, how much water it uses, the, sorry, the size of load is the top left one, and also how much noise it makes. Uh, very relevant uh, to other products as well. And, um, and what happens at, um, just stepping back from the, the kind of, shall we say, the day-to-day -day of repairing products, is quite interesting to understand what, what drives how products are designed. Um, and energy labelling policy and eco-design regulation policy, which are intimately related, are two of those drivers. The eco-design regulation, in, previously in EU law, now domestically, will set criteria and those are often, then they will be implemented through the energy label, particularly when you're selling products to consumers. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing more criteria being attached to products. So it used to be largely that it was just the energy rating that was, was seen as an important thing. Um, to an extent, there's a, there's, a, there's a tick in the box for that. A lot has been done on that. Sometimes it's through technological change, like the change from incandescent lights to LED lighting. That might have happened anyway, but that's possibly been accelerated significantly by these sorts of um, initiatives. But more moving towards, well, what can we do beyond um, merely, merely saving energy? And therefore, one seeing more of these sorts of um, criteria being placed as, as potential drivers or influences to consumers when they buy products. Influences some and not others. It certainly provides information if you're inclined to look at it. And one aspect that is coming in there is more, more to do with aspects which affect repairability. Um, and domestic washing machines is, is one of the first from back from 2019. 
um, and that there are others besides coming along. And, and it's interesting to see what it, what it sets is requirements of spare parts, that they shall be made available to professional repairers. Is a repair cafe a professional repairer? That is a really significant question. There's some sh shaking heads shaking heads here and, and that's a, a, a serious argument uh, to be had as to in terms of for example access to spare parts what sort of spare parts do you have access to access to instructions and um, and also access to software and firmware updates for example um, so many products go obsolete because you just can't uh, run the apps on them for example anymore uh, what tools do you need to repair it are they commonly available whatever that means um, without damaging it, what parts are, are available and for how long, um, how long will it take to actually get hold of the part, is it available at a reasonable price, whatever reasonable means, um, and as I mentioned, who is a professional repairer, what hoops do you have to jump through and how long is that going to take, how much is it going to cost. So I think I, t I take this as an encouraging indicator of, of where policy is, is pushing manufacturers to change their products to make them more um, sustainable in the, in, the, in the broadest sense. If you look at um, the UK, um, back in 2021, the uh, Department uh, for Business, Energy and in Industrial Strategy, Bayes, whose activity is now being uh, managed by a new um, government ministry called DESNES, Department of Sustainability, Net Zero, which hasn't been around for more than a few months, um, uh, published this thing called the Energy Related Products Policy uh, Framework. Um, and that sets a number of objectives. I haven't got them all here, but um, most of the, the objectives I set out there in black are all to do largely with energy, which was historically the emphasis of policy in this area, driving product design. But it, it was in, it's encouraging to see in there that looking at circular economy aspects is, has, is a significant part of that. So looking at more repairable products, more durable products, more recyclable products uh, to retain value for as long as possible, which, which relates very closely to that um, 10 R's. I love that 10 R's thing that um, Martin mentioned earlier. And then it talks about next steps uh, that the, the, the government uh, intends to look at look at different product groups for which energy efficiency standards are to be introduced to consider whether these sorts of things could be introduced. Uh, things like spare part availability repair information so you know what to do with the spare parts and also software and firmware aspects as well. Um, so this is like um, a, a declaration of intent. The government is now th through its um, ministries and so on working on areas of product policy which is kind of working in parallel with what's happening in other parts of the world, particularly the EU, because until recently that was the, we were part of that in, in a more uh, joined up way, but other parts of the world as well. The, NG, the UK now has, and has the um, ability to make its own decisions to some extent. Uh, by UK, I, I largely mean GB because of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which has an impact on that. A different story, different conversation. Um, it's interesting to see what's happening in other parts of the world. Has anybody come across this? No, one or two, three or four. Excellent. Um, France has decided to um, uh, plough its own furrow here or, or kind of push ahead an agenda which um, to do with repairability um, to promote um, a more, uh, uh, shall we say, an ambitious approach to... to um, indicating how important repair is and, and, and providing consumers with information about how repairable a product is. Um, so there is, um, there is a repairability index, uh, and red's not so great, Eight point, and, and green, uh, dark green is really good, um, and there's a score out of 10. That score is based on, on assessment against um, a, quite a, an extensive list of criteria, things like... Um, Availability documentation, the ease of disassembly, availability, price of spares, and so on and so on. Um, it gives the consumer some ability to, to choose products, uh, taking into account these things. Um, it has to be uh, information has to be provided at the point of, of sale, whether it's online or, or in a shop uh, or whatever, uh, at a reasonable size, so you, it's not hidden away in in the small print. Um, currently. 
it applies to um, uh, what they call porthole washing machines. We got one of those. Um, uh, phone, smartphones, mobiles, laptops, uh, TVs, uh, lawnmowers, with more products to come. I'll say a little bit about those uh, later on. So this is interesting. This is French. There is no EU um, version of this. There's no UK version of this. But of course, the UK sees this. The EU sees this. What does it do about it? Does it um, adopt it or do something similar or, 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 or whatever? If you look at uh, where things are going in the EU, uh, let's talk about mobile phones and tablets. Who's broken their mobile phone by, break, by dropping it? Yeah, okay. Who's dropped it in the bath or in some water? <laughs> yeah, some people have done both. I mean, fantastic. Yeah, I think mean, we've all done that. Um, it is really so frustrating, isn't it, that uh, you know, what is actually a very expensive um, product um, is, um, it is so easy to break. Um, they're amazing things. But also, of course, um, who gets frustrated about the battery life in their phones? Hands up for that one. <laughs> oh, that's a biggie, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and um, so the EU is, is currently considering bringing in a, um, a requirement that for, for mobile phones and tablet devices, uh, whatever the operating system, that they, they have criteria not just to do with energy performance, but to do with the longevity of the product. Um, so they've got these four labels bottom left, which I've blown up on the right here, to do with battery endurance, um, to do with free fall reliability class. <laughs> Isn't that a nice way of putting it? Uh, sounds like parachuting or something. Um, but, but with an A to an A to E, not A to G rating, um, not as prominent as the energy thing, but it, it's there. Um, water ingress, the IP rating, you're, you're some, no doubt a lot of you will be familiar with IP rating, which is a, a, a thing already, is, uh, which is used on many products, um, to do with water and dust getting into a product. And also repairability class, and again, there are criteria, there's a scoring system associated uh, with that. So this is an indication of where the EU is intended to go with product policy. Um, and, and to put an energy label on a product which says that means that the, the manufacturer has to back it up with, with some substantive uh, tools to actually enable these things to happen. Like if you're going to repair a product, the, 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 um, the part has to be available. It has to be available for a certain period of time. That will be um, stated in, in the uh, regulation. The ones that come out so far have tended to say something like 10 years. It might compartmentalise it into what spares are available to um, professionals, however they're defined, and what are available to, to users. Um, so, and, and that's pretty significant uh, in terms of how repairable a product will be for most people and for most repair cafes, I would guess. Um, so I would expect to see more uh, ambitious requirements such as this and such as on the washing machines coming in for in EU and in other jurisdictions, possibly the UK uh, too, as the kind of the churn of this, these sorts of policies um, comes up. Each, each, any policy in this sort of area has, has a sort of a renewal uh, point uh, written into it. Several years after the regulation comes into force, it will say you know, it must be renewed, it must be re reviewed, and as part of that review process, these sorts of requirements would be taken into account in the EU, and I would anticipate also in the UK. What one does as a result for a particular product, whatever it might be, depends. Um, but it is there as, a, as something to be looked at. And I would see the fact that there is already policy in place for things like washing machines. And this, I believe, is supposed to be kind of uh, enacted in 2024, although I haven't actually seen any official information on that in the EU, as an indicator of where things could be going. And of course, then there's the question about uh, what different jurisdictions do as a result of, one, of another jurisdiction um, choosing to put in place a policy. If the EU does, EU does something with respect to uh, a more ambitious en uh, energy label, what does the UK do about it? Uh, vice versa. And the same thing goes for other uh, jurisdictions as well. Influences are very broad, and particularly from, some, say, from the US. 
just to give you a little bit of a feel for the sort of work that's been done under the bonnet, bonnet on, on this sort of thing, um, the Joint Research Centre, which is, an, which is a European Commission um, a research organisation, did a study which, that which was published um, uh, earlier this year looking at what they call potential horizontal or provisions. In other words, provisions or requirements could be set on products irrespective of uh, the sort of product it is. Martin, will these slides be available to people after the event? Yeah. Well, if anybody wants the slides, um, I, I'm very happy to give them to you. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, there's a hyperlink bottom left, but too small to read unless you're at the front, sorry. Um, but uh, what's interesting here is they're looking at all sorts of uh, things which would be helpful from the repairability aspect of products. Uh, things like uh, stipulating a minimum lifetime uh, and how products should be labelled, how it should be um, how it should be robust against um, things like dropping various stresses, durability, um, having this repairability index scoring system. So the French uh, example is there. Um, availability of information, availability of spare parts, including software and firmware, um, tools and skills. Um, how you actually identify the parts that are appropriate for a product. If you've ever been had to repair something, how difficult it is sometimes to understand whether a, a component on a website is the right one for the product that you want to fix. Really, really hard, isn't it? Um, um, and also modularity. And I think that's particularly interesting. Wouldn't it be nice if, when you took, it, took apart a, um, a vacuum cleaner, um, you could just put in any part because it, it's a generic part. That, that kind of exists in some areas of product design, like you know, bicycles often have very standard sort of components, even if they're different models, speaking as a cyclist. And, um, um, but obviously there's divergence there and there isn't um, a regulation there. And they've looked at what, where, what sort of products could potentially be covered. So they looked at um, clothing and footwear on the left. They looked at furniture and you know, furnishings. They've looked at beddings. That's what those, that's what those um, matrix things are in the third column across. Um, toys and also electric devices uh, like scooters. I don't know whether that includes electric bikes. It might. But also energy-related products, which means anything which, which um, has an influence on energy consumption. So it could be an energy-consuming thing or it could be um, a window. Which, which also has um, implications in terms of energy use. So they're thinking very broadly. I think it's quite an encouraging uh, suggestion of where things are going, but of course that has to have teeth before it actually affects product design, and then it rolls through into products which may or may not be easier to repair. Thank you. I think we should be okay. So I think um, where we think see, seeing things going is that in the future more products are likely to become subject to more uh, right to repair related requirements, which I personally feel is encouraging. So that hopefully will have a positive impact on availability of spares in the broader sense and instructions to enable you to uh, do something with it. Uh, a positive influence on product durability. Wouldn't it be nice if repair cafes weren't necessary in that context? Though I think there are other benefits of it, as has been eloquently talked about already making products easier to disassemble uh, without destroying things. And then just thinking about what might be happening in, um, on this side of the water. Uh, we're, there's, there's various influences that I've touched on here. That There's the EU influence, which is still very significant, and we've seen the mobiles and tablets. What other products will be brought in? I'm sure there will be. Um, the French influence, uh, I mentioned the repairability index. So apart from the products I mentioned already, they're also looking at other types of washing machines, a top-loading washing machine, I haven't got one of those, um, a dishwasher, vacuum cleaners, high-pressure cleaners. Um, so there's, they're looking at um, products which they consider significant. The EU may possibly take a similar approach. We will see, and, and the UK also may consider these things. Um, currently, in their um, energy-related products policy framework, the UK, um, that UK policy document uh, mentions a number of products. Uh, the only one of relevancy in, in the domestic context is uh, cooking appliances. Um, but they also mentioned about bringing in 
these kind of horizontal measures to do with sustainability and repairability for other products as they come up for review. So hopefully we will see more repairability criteria being taken into account in products which will make re repairing products in a repair cafe even more of a joy than it is already and hopefully even less necessary um, so that um, it will become a, a really positive and engine for change. So that's all there is from me. Um, thank you very much for your time everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, before, before, uh, before our other people are thinking about maybe a couple of questions. So, as you you well defined, I think a key issue coming into the future will be what is the definition of a professional repairer? Uh, lifetime of experience. You all around the table, the tables. You know, is that? Professional? Is it not? Pro How is that going to be defined? Mm -hmm. I think the other issue is many of us, of course, see that the vast majority of products coming into repair cafes are not designed for disassembly, are not designed for repairability. So I guess the issue is how quickly that will flow through legislation into product design and development. Uh, there's still, of course, a lot of legacy products coming in over the years. So I. I, I you know, that's just some, some, maybe mm. some, some thoughts while I pick up some people who, you know, maybe mm. if, uh, if you have a crack at that and I'll mm. look for some hands. Yeah, Stuart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> hello. Um, the, the impact of some of these local and national schemes, like the French Repairability Yang, um, uh, legislation is having global impact so there are uh, um, repair manuals becoming available in French for things to satisfy the French repairability index but of course the community immediately translates those into English and whatever and so that they're globally available so I think the, the, you know although you say the, like the French Repairability Index only applies in France, it does have a global influence. Yeah, I, I quite, quite agree with you, Stuart. It's, it's an informal influence, but it is an influence. People, you know, the information is out there and people can choose to do what they will with it. And that's, you know, that's an encouraging thing to hear. I guess there's schemes like iFixit and so on, which, are, which perhaps act as a hub for that sort of thing as well. Thanks, thank you. Good comment. Hello, um, I'm Laura from Glastonbury and um, I wanted to pick up on several things that have been said. One is um, radical, the other is right to repair and the other is just getting on with it yourself. Um, we in Glastonbury are quite different <laughs> to a lot of other towns and believe in, in doing things ourselves. We've had several people's assemblies and lots of good stuff has come out of that. Um, we do have a right to repair and we are prevented from doing that a lot of the time. And just getting on with it yourself can involve, for example, we had a Krupp's coffee maker, I think it was, which was broken. I think Krupp's are quite a well-known make. I, I believe they're Swiss. And we were very surprised that we couldn't even get into this device. So we write to them, or I wrote to them, and said we were pretty disgusted with this. And they wrote back and said they would do something about it. Um, so this, this hasn't gone on and on, but there are other instances where my husband repairs and he gets really annoyed when he can't get into the item or he can't get a part. And he always says to the suppliers, why aren't you making it available to me? And he really makes them think. So we can do a lot by writing to all the companies and speaking out that can make a huge difference and that can move government to make a change. They're not going to make the change for us. We always do it from the ground up. You all know that. So I'd like to just encourage everybody to, to write, to send an email and the sharing aspect was fantastic and we could do that more and more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, from a personal perspective, I'd, I, I, I'd, I'd entirely, entirely echo that and I think there is a 
there's certainly a, a role for um, um, advocacy for putting that in for that those views to to people who make decisions on on policy uh, such that you know this this for example what is a professional uh, repairer how is that definition uh, kind of brought into being and what criteria are set against it I, I, my personal suggestion would, would be that it would be great for um, organisations, networks in the repair space, perhaps, uh, you know, our, our Welsh colleague, you know, Phoebe, might have a view here about um, the extent to which um, repair cafes or networks of repair cafes should get, have a collective voice and try to get a, vo um, a seat at the table to do with uh, saying, well, you know, why shouldn't we? Uh, we're happy to jump through a few hoops to be seen as professional repairers. But, but what does that mean? Don't just exclude us because we're not, a, you know, a, a professional body in a, in a formal sense. Maybe there are ways that it can be done. I don't know, but I think there's a right to being part of the table at the table. I don't know whether you want to say anything about that, Phoebe. Um, yeah, I guess just, just echoing a little bit. Do you want to use the Do you want to use the mic? Hello. Can I can I raise a, a point that's more general, which is the increasing importance of software. Mechanical things are becoming much more reliable, but software is becoming more and more important in controlling what that does. As a classic example in cars, this is not for repair cafes, but it's illustrative. My car broke down, I had a one hour recovery, and I was talking to the recovery driver. His life has been made hell by the car manufacturers of electric cars because they're very reliable except the software and each manufacturer will not release any details or any upgrades on its software. And the garage, the independent garage I took it back to said, our days are numbered mm. because in 10 years time, you will just have to take it back to the dealer's garage because they're the only people who can get into the software. We have a T4, which is a standard analyzer. It doesn't work on electric cars. Mm. The movement is against us because I mean, Apple is infamous for this. The major manufacturers don't want us to repair it. Mm. It's an interesting point. I've suffered the same thing myself. Um, don't, could Phoebe possibly say something about the advocacy side of things before we move on to the next question? Sorry, I'm sort of beginning to chair this, but uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, it was just to the point about the, the seat at the table, and I think kind of absolutely echoing your point about um, just doing something, just getting on with it. And I guess that's where the power of networks comes in in this kind of UK approach, is that we can have a much louder voice if we're all contributing all of our data and our stories together. We hear so many ex similar examples where one of our visitors has contacted the manufacturer, had a bit of a half-hearted response back, where they maybe sent them a voucher or something. You know, there's there's very little movement on those one-off occasions but if we kind of combine it all together we have a little bit more of a powerful voice um, we met with a couple of UK gov representatives the other day who were looking at eco-labelling repairability isn't included in that in the moment, at the moment because it just hasn't been considered by them so I think it's something we can all be a little bit loud we're all trying to do the same thing aren't we we're all trying to move in the same direction so that's where I think repair cafes can play in here we've got all those examples we know who those repeat offenders are we've got all those stories and it's about um, channeling that all together so it's a little bit louder okay I think that's great I really appreciate I, I, I think I mean just a quick comment on that as, as well I think uh, you know, the way this works in policy often is that particularly the responsible body, possibly, you know, DEFRA will run, often run roundtables and stakeholder meetings. And certainly I can sort of remember sort of 10 years ago when some of this was evolving, uh, no repair cafes at the table, even an unnamed Korean company saying, we don't want repair cafes. So the, the you know, uh, I would say now the world has evolved and I'd say with those consultations you know uh, there needs to be repair cafes now starting to engage in that policy process how they do that is another issue it requires or it often requires a trade association or some central body to do that difficult for individuals to engage but I think it it's certainly an issue you know that that policy makers need to, to, to pick up on Anyway, we're now going into some very practical presentations by colleagues. 
So we've got Martin from uh, uh, Lover Dover. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think I pronounced it right. I hope I did. Uh, so uh, we might need to uh, move it back to the, 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 the remove the microphone screen just to. Okay, there's a lot of technical requests going on. I think let, let's get through to lunch, and then we will use lunch to try and deal with these, these other issues. So let, let's get through to lunch first. We've heard what you said, but we, 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 we're trying to uh, move, move forward. So I'm now going to pass across to Martin. And Martin's got ten minutes I know. to <laughs> present. Exactly. You uh, need three of them. Okay, well, seven minutes then. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Where's my presentation? Ah, right. So, I'm Martin Davis from Lover Repair Cafe. Um, I haven't got time, so I'll skip this bit, but um, what is Lover? Well, Lover's a village um, in Wiltshire, seven and a half miles south of Salisbury. Um, it has a population of about 2,800 people. It's tiny, um, but it's got a good community spirit and that's the important thing and you can see there um, the early part of February they will open up a pop-up post office where you can literally have your Valentine card sent postmarked Lover or Lover all for charity they also boast that they have the world's biggest village garage sale in April and it is the whole village opens their gates people walk around the whole village one day a year when everyone has a garage sale. Charity, wonderful. So uh, the point is that we're starting off with a very, very important community spirit. So how do we start? Paul, who's with me, and Morris um, got to know each other as part of Silver Surfers. Some of you may know this, um, learning about the internet and learning how to be safe on the internet. And um, they both felt they wanted to do a bit more so having learned their skills, they did some searching. And they discovered the Men's Shed organization. And they went back to the, look, look what we found, great. And the women said, hang on a minute. So they looked again. And at, at that point, they discovered the Repair Cafe organization. And um, they founded the cafe in March 2019. What are we about? Well, are we, we're, we've ended up being different to the Repair Cafe model. And I'll explain why shortly. But basically, we meet every Wednesday and Friday morning. So we're about halfway house to what you were talking about with the repair shops, as, as it were. We operate a walk-in service. There's no pre-booking required. We've got about 50 volunteer repairers, some of whom can only work from home. Okay, so that's, that's partially the reason why. Thank you. <laughs> um, the repairers mostly are um, retired professionals. Some of them are still working, which is why they have to work from home. And some of them are maybe medically unwell and unable to mix with people, but still obviously have something to give, so they, they work from home. And we we'll obviously repair things and so on, but if things are unrepairable, rather than just give them back and say take them away, we actually break them down and recycle them on site. So they're split into metals, plastics and electronics, and then taken away. We've got clients in Wiltshire, in Hampshire, in Dorset. There's a client that comes down from Chippenham, which is about 40 miles away, and another one from Canterbury. I kid you not. So the usual run of stuff, we repair coals, um, clothes, furniture, electrical appliances, clocks. We've got a saying, basically, do not bin it, we may fix it. And we do, uh, you'll see about that later on. Right, COVID. Well, we didn't let COVID stop us working. Within the rules, when we were allowed to, we operated, as you can see there, from a, um, a garage, an open garage in the open air. And we adopted the model of the repair shop, like um, Farnham did with bag and drop, effectively. We had a table there, the people would come up, put the item on the table, and step back, and then we'd work, work out what they wanted, and we'd then go and take it, and then 
move on. And as the, as the regulations relaxed, we were able to be a bit more free with people coming in and so on. Um, so we changed how we work so that what we adopted more of the drop-off model for repairs. Because the object of the game is to repair. It's not necessarily just showing somebody you can repair it. It's actually to do the repairs. Um, part of this, there was obviously the drive for the NHS, you know, to support the NHS, and our people who were coming to us with stuff to repair. Could we deliver, could we take donations for the NHS? I'll show you a bit more of that in, in, um, in the next slide or so. The important thing was maintain the community, maintain the contact, and people were able to sort of not mingle, but work um, along there. So, charity works. We, because of that start with the charity bit, we ended up, well, as you can see there, we've now donated £26,000 to charity. That is just out of... Thank you. That's just out of people's donations after the running costs for the cafe are taken out and so on. So that, um, as you can see there, and there's a presentation there from the Stars Appeal. We, regu we make regular monthly donations, around about 800 a month-ish, plus or minus. Salisbury Hospital Stars Appeal. Um, we're going there next week to talk to them about how our money is being spent. We've raised £14,000 for them. Salisbury Hospice, Wiltshire Air Ambulance. Homestar South Wiltshire and some local preschools that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for money like ours go in there to help them work. So, and there's a lot of other stuff behind, behind the scenes as well on that. Those are the, the regular ones, if you like. Moving on, job stats. Well, we've held 360 events. We meet twice a week, so that's why. Um, we've got 940 clients and a lot of repeat customers, a lot of repeat customers. We've completed 4,600 jobs. Of these, 3,800 were successful repairs. Now that's 83%. I know that's massively more than you would perhaps expect, but we don't have the one day fix issue. We take away at the end of the day and repair them and bring them back. Because we're open twice a week, there's a quick turnaround. So if it needs a part, we can get a part in and it's back with the customer within maybe a week, maybe less, depending. So, t taking your, you know, we're halfway to the, the repair shop, if you like, the repair model that they're talking about, operating as a cafe. Um, you're, yes, we have the same issue with you about the uh, interaction with the repairer, but we get a huge amount of repeat business. So, in a way, we have got engagement. Anyway, going on. Um, the 26, the, we take 90 jobs a month-ish, give or take. Um, 26,000 to charity and using the Farnham method we've diverted 14 tonnes from landfill we've saved 154 tonnes of CO2 equivalent I don't know how we can get an accurate figure here but we reckon on the same figures around 300,000 we've saved our community by not them not having to buy a new kit I don't know there's a huge amount to gain from that because you don't know whether they would repair or do without or whatever never mind um, yes, like everyone else, the same jobs, it's electrical lamps, it's heaters, it's kitchen appliances. We get phases during the year. March, April, May, the garden furniture will come out or the garden tools will come out and we have to repair them because they haven't been maintained. Towards Christmas, the Christmas tree lights will come out. You know, all these things. But essentially, um, we're brilliant on things like woodwork, which is with our furniture repairs and restorations. We do a lot of mechanical clocks. Um, electrical items, not so much for the reasons we've had mentioned. You can't get into them. You can't get the parts. Um, computing is the worst of all. Did you know printers have a kill switch? Print 100,000 pages and they will stop? Yeah, absolutely. It's built into their software. And you can repair it, sir. £80 for the part for a £60 printer. Never mind. Anyway, um, so that you can see there, we, 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 on top of our um, statistics, whether we do it quite the same way as others, I don't know, but we've got a, a spreadsheet behind the scenes. In fact, we should be at work now. They'll be coming to the end of our Friday session. So if I had a live feed, I could show you the, the jobs we've taken in today. Um, but it's not about statistics. It's about sharing skills. It's about seeing the joy on people's faces 
when you hand something precious back to them. A memory, as, as someone said, you repair a memory. It's fantastic. It's about people coming together who might all only be sitting in their lounge watching daytime TV. Genuinely, we've had people come in and they get to, get to grips with things, help each other, learn from each other, share the knowledge, share what we do. It is fabulous. And it is amongst repairers, it's also amongst clients, it is a great feeling. And equally, as you can see on the right there, it's about providing somewhere for people to come and chat. And that's important too. So summary then quickly, the cafe meets twice a week and provides a regular social focus for the community where visitors come, can come along for a coffee, a cake and a chat and bring some into repair, why not? It's also there for the repairers who value the friendship, the support and the social side, and in addition to the challenges. And many visitors have commented how positive the atmosphere is during our meetings. You know, there's like an energy there, which is, you must feel the same as well when you do yours. It is a great, great feeling being there. Even just twice a week, it's still a great feeling. And we've been recognised. We, we, we had no idea about this. We had an email out of the blue. We've been, short, we've been nominated for BBC Radio Wiltshire's Make a Difference Awards and we're one of four finalists in the community group category. We won't know any more until September. But the BBC have been in and talked to us, taken uh, interviews, a little video clip here and there, and uh, we wait and see. Thank you. So great, thank you very much indeed, Martin. What, what we're going to do is we've got a couple more presentations from colleagues from, uh, from, from Cambridge and from Sutton, and then we'll have a panel where you can grill the guys. So build up your questions. So I'll pass across uh, to our colleague from Cambridge now. Hello everyone, um, so I'm Sandy, I'm from the Cambridgeshire Repair Cafe Network, so we sort of sit somewhere between what you were hearing uh, earlier from Phoebe at the sort of uh, kind of um, country level um, and uh, the local groups like Lover. I mean those stats were just absolutely amazing, uh, of, yeah, the money raised for charity. So um, we have a growing network in, uh, in Cambridgeshire, uh, we've trained over 80 groups, uh, we've got a really sort of dense cluster of uh, repair cafes there. Uh, we've got uh, 35 repair cafes planned for the year. We've got 20 active groups kind of within Cambridge and the local area. I work for a charity called Cambridge Carbon Footprint and we kind of help to uh, run the network to kind of coordinate the network. And we operate in a hub and spoke model. So we have kind of resources that we have that we lend out to, to different organ repair cafe organising groups and community groups. Uh, and we've got this real bottom-up emphasis. So we don't sort of go in and run repair cafes and communities. We kind of really try to support the bits of interest that there are in different areas and kind of build that up. So what sort of help do we uh, offer to our, to our repair cafes? So we actually have a physical toolkit that uh, these different groups kind of book uh, for their repair cafes. Um, we also have an organisers hub, so we have all sorts of uh, kind of information, the sort of stuff that Phoebe mentioned earlier, so uh, booking systems, insurance, that sort of thing is all on the organisers hub. What we also have kind of on that sort of local level is a register of repairers, so because we're not just off sorry, one, uh, one uh, village or one small uh, community. We're trying to kind of bridge gaps and, and uh, help people find re repairers across Cambridgeshire. So we've got a register of over 100 repairers. And what we do is we send out a monthly newsletter and that includes all the repair cafes that are coming up in Cambridgeshire and then repairers can sign up to repair at, at different uh, repair cafes uh, across that network. And... Um, so a big thing that we're trying to do at the moment is kind of build partnerships uh, and uh, move to this model of kind of, you know, having more regular spaces uh, and I guess sort of trying out different things uh, that we can do in, in Cambridge. 
Um, so in terms of partnership building, so that left photo that's in the Grand Arcade in Cambridge. So I think that's something that we'll all be seeing on the high street and in arcades as these empty units. Uh, so the Grand Arcade have actually got quite sort of forward thinking marketing people and they've created this Let's Go Circular unit and we do pop up repair cafes in there. Um, we also, so this is our repair cafe from International Repair Day uh, last year. Um, they, this is a group of, uh, a lot of those uh, at Centec, which is a local tech company in Cambridge. And what we're doing is we're finding that a lot of tech companies are very interested in repair cafes as a way to um, sort of offer their employees vol volunteering opportunities and team building and that sort of thing. And we're having really good conversations um, with companies about that. Uh, also kind of trying to use that as a way to raise funds, to kind of support the network, to have more toolkits, more training sessions and more resources available to sort of support local repair cafes. Um, on the data side, so we've seen like, lo lots of different ways that people store data. Uh, what we encourage is that people put their data into uh, the restart fixometer. Um, that is, uh, so you can put in your, your item data and it all goes into the Open Repair Alliance, which, uh, you know, all these different things uh, feed into the same uh, place. What's really, really powerful about that is that we can actually, as local groups, have an influence on that wider um, uh, policy level. And, you know, right to repair is such a nuanced uh, issue, actually. It's not, it's not a, I, I have the right to repair, I don't have the right to repair. It has to be negotiated on the really, really detailed level. And it's only by having this data at the hands of people who are actually going in and confronting the people who are lobbying on behalf of companies uh, that you can really have that impact. And this is a way that local groups can really sort of support that wider movement and create that change uh, at, the, at the policy level. So um, that's one of the things that we're sort of really uh, encouraging. And, and we're trying to link that in. So we have uh, a single listing of the kind of repair cafes happening in Cambridgeshire but what we're doing is we're trying to link it to this system so that people just list their event once in this and then it pulls through to our kind of general uh, listings for Cambridgeshire and goes on the map and stuff. Um, so the charity I work for is called Cambridge Carbon Footprint and we, we do all sorts of different environmental uh, kind of community initiatives. Uh, we run open eco homes, which is where people who have done things to say retrofit their houses, show other people around their houses. We have talks on heat pumps, on ventilation systems, all sorts of things like that. We also uh, lend out thermal imaging cameras so that people can uh, uh, have a look at where their houses are losing heat and uh, and then take measures to kind of address that. And what we find is that repair cafes is an, an amazing place to talk to people about all these different things uh, that are on offer um, locally to kind of support them to reduce their impact on the environment. It's a really great way to kind of start talking to people. We've created something called the Cambridge Climate Map which is a directory of all the different businesses and all the different types of support locally. And we encourage, you know, we bring our outreach volunteers out to different repair cafes and talk to people there because there's quite a lot of waiting around often as well in between things. Um, so yeah, so, so next steps kind of looking ahead, we're like just wanting to be more efficient and more um, sort of helpful to the repair cafes that we support. Um, but we're also really interested kind of being here and hearing more about what other people are doing in terms of supporting people uh, through repair cafes, through initiatives like, uh, you know, fix factories, or these uh, re local repair hubs where, where it's and linked to the library of things. Or this is from uh, the Haus der Eigenarbeit in Munich. It's kind of linking it more to sort of craft and uh, uh, doing your own DIY skills so there seems to be lots of different opportunities to kind of take things forward um, but yeah we're really excited to be here and to share that with you, thank you Yeah, tough act to follow here um, we are a relatively young repair cafe so just about a year old uh, it started off with an idea and our founders I think were thinking about it for a while uh, 
largely frustrated with uh, things that are thrown into landfill and also about repairability. So um, <clears throat> an idea though, therefore, is not enough. And uh, we needed people. And uh, you need people that are diverse. Uh, we found we had three engineers, two of them um, electrical, one mechanical, an accountant, uh, a media person, and a health and safety uh, in construction um, professional. So we sat together about uh, a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, and we put together a plan in order to uh, get things going. Now, um, the components of that group, the diversity, I think, is what actually transform the idea into something that we could do uh, uh, to take action on. And in addition to that, of course, all of us, I think, are slightly mad. <laughs> so um, what happened after that? We decided to do something, create a cafe um, in Sutton, which is uh, in London. F funnily enough, there's a lot of repair activity in Surrey, but not so much in London. People are relatively, I think, busier or just not bothered or whatever. So um, a cafe close to us, Ruskin Road, had already had those same uh, uh, thoughts. And we decided to have two of them side by side uh, and work together. So uh, we had to do a lot of work not knowing uh, the direction of travel, so we had to do a lot of discovery. We had to see what we needed to do, what kinds of things we wanted to do, uh, repair, and how to do them. So um, we also had to understand what sort of entity we had to create, whether it was a charity, how much effort was required, what was the banking, what was all of those uh, um, affiliations, things like that. So fortunately, my um, colleagues, uh, Tom here, the chair, is here with us. Uh, he did a lot of work with the affiliation with the Repair Cafe in, in Amsterdam, um, uh, got us registered there. And we had lots of meetings, lots of meetings, and decisions, decisions, decisions. Um, we had to get together all the resources required, and there are a lot for those who are on their way. Uh, what we see in the sessions which happen once a month is just the top of the iceberg. The what, there's heavy lifting beneath that, beneath the waterline. Uh, there's lots of meetings, there's lots of organization, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, interaction with local uh, resources and so on and so forth. So funds, insurance, the venue, volunteers, methods. Martin helped us a lot. Uh, we um, we got uh, the format of some of his forms. We observed what how he was running his cafe and so on and so forth. The media and the website for advertising and volunteers and so on. And we decided to have a soft launch uh, to test out what we thought would be the format of how we how we would go about things. So uh, a few months later, uh, we planned for the so uh, uh, soft launch. And after that, again, some more meetings and decisions. So we had a soft launch uh, in July, which is four or five months after we decided to move forward. Uh, we had a group by that time of about 10 to 15 volunteers. Uh, we didn't advertise it a lot because we didn't know uh, what we would, how we would handle it. It was basically to test out the process, the workflow, uh, and see how we would interact with the volunteers and the customers. Um, our venue is a community uh, garden uh, center. It's uh, um, it one community. Uh, garden I think for London an award last year 
and it's a it's a good place where it's child friendly uh, and there's a lot of footfall so we we chose that because of that location um, and the objective of uh, uh, of the soft launch was to uh, check the that the venue and uh, and the volunteers and uh, everything flowed well and then a few months later in September was our first full session um, and uh, you can see over there uh, we oddly enough after all the planning for all kinds of things the first uh, uh, item for repair was a wooden uh, to toys, uh, to, um, child's bike and uh, um, we fortunately have volunteers who have been in the repair business and are tinkerers essentially uh, who can turn their hand to uh, a lot of diverse uh, things so our, uh, this volunteer here does some electrical, some woodwork, some uh, plastic repair, all of those kind of things, uh, and so. Um, uh, it was very busy. Uh, we had a lot of energy from there, both uh, from, the, from the clients as well as from the volunteers, and everybody was quite a, uh, excited and satisfied. Um, the, the thing we noticed about, uh, to the point someone made about donations, is that in our case, we get donations from even the people who uh, whose items are not repaired. We've noticed that. And um, I think it is because they sense the energy and they sense the willingness and they sense the value of the, uh, uh, of the initiative uh, and they want to be part of it. Uh, so to the point of leaving something for repair, I think people uh, will donate less because they don't have that uh, connection. Uh, then we went on to have regular sessions every month. Ours, ours runs on the second Saturday of every month, uh, the same as Farnham. And um, uh, the, it's, it's timed uh, for ease as well because our, our neighboring Ruskin Road Cafe is on the fourth Sunday, uh, uh, Saturday of every month. So we don't clash. And in fact, uh, if something happens, uh, if a repair cannot be done at ours, we sometimes refer them over there. We also have volunteers who uh, work at both cafes. So it's good for them so that they don't clash. Uh, we have a variety of items, lots of learning opportunities. Uh, um, for the kids, particularly if they are toys and so on, to show them how things are repaired. Uh, you can see some of our um, volunteers actually spending the time to show youngsters how to, how to do stuff. Richard, by the way, that volunteer there uh, works for Google. His full-time job is at Google but he is actually a board level repair specialist. He also does uh, bikes, so he calls himself a psychologist. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> uh, you can see here the the sort of the intensity and also the excitement and also the the, the, the almost the passion from some of those images there. Um, uh, we had um, we had obviously to uh, to to decide and choose what tools we needed so um, um, we have a pat tester we got ourselves pat testing uh, qualified uh, and we have in fact two devices and uh, three uh, pat testing people who are available and standby um, our We've had nine or so sessions so far, full full blown sessions, and it's still a work in progress. And we are still uh, learning about workflow, about data collection, about um, deciding which items to take home. We're doing all of that, but uh, we want to make uh, optimize the the workflow as we go along. So. Uh, community uh, um, is important, uh, not only 
our committee, but also our community, larger community of volunteers. So we had a uh, a, a meal uh, um, in the summer uh, last year, and we also had a get together at Christmas where we um, we had a meal after the session, uh, so that uh, we we connect uh, culturally as well. Um, Last session, uh, after last session, we had our AGM, our an annual general meeting, where we actually had the volunteers um, and the committee uh, talk about our impact and talk about and get feedback from them as to how um, they feel about um, the ongoing workflow and process and so on and so forth. and. Also to talk about our financials, uh, we are sort of more or less sustainable. We we get uh, a little bit more of donation than it costs us to run a session. So touch wood, at, at the moment we we are sort of cash neutral, um, and um, we we believe that it's it's much more than just repairs. The activity is about building uh, people, building people's uh, personal development, and also uh, impacting the community. So our impact so far in a nutshell, I think, um, again, that's why diversity matters. Uh, uh, the, the cafe earlier talked about not having a lot of electrical. We see a lot of electrical, uh, in fact, electrical is our major source of items brought for repair. Um, we have uh, textiles and garments um, as the next lot. We have uh, three, three, four volunteers, I think, two, three sewing machines. So we do a lot of that work and then a diverse little bit of the others. And we uh, we get, we we are getting better, but we complete about fifty percent of our repairs uh, uh, as of the end of last year. Um, and I think as we learn as to what what uh, e um, consumables are required, and we get more skilled in doing things within that session, we will get better. But I think we are aiming for the uh, 60 to 70 percent repair rate. Um, now, the last bit is in in terms of the impact. It's also not the, just the impact of the people coming to us, but it's also about building alliances. So uh, we are trying to work with the local reuse shop from Veolia, the recycling facility close to us, to see whether we can. Uh, repair and resell items that are brought in to them for uh, for recycling. What next? Um, we believe uh, the repair cafes, as others have said, um, have got community social cohesion impacts, uh, large ones, and so we are investigating how. Uh, we can make a difference in the wider community. Um, uh, working with uh, teaching, particularly younger people, about the uh, about repairability, about uh, uh, spurring curiosity, changing mindset, changing behavior. Um, the other bit I think is very important is about going uh, upstream and. Others have talked about this before as well. We, we in the the repair ecosystem is a downstream thing. So it is something that has broken. Uh, a lot of these uh, broken things, uh, which are before their end of their useful life, are because designs are bad, uh, and and a, a, a community like ours can feed back so that uh, we can we can sort of influence designers to make things uh, last longer, make them uh, less in need for repair. Um, 
I talked about uh, Violi a little bit. So we are we are working with them. We are running a pilot. This um, um, session tomorrow will have some of the things brought in for recycling at the local recycling facility to our cafe, and we'll see how that goes. And then, based on that, we will see whether we can have a volume of uh, uh, of those kind of things to make bigger impact. And and lastly. The Repair Cafe has uh, brought uh, us inspiration for other ideas. Me personally, I'm, I'm working with a project where uh, we're trying to um, regenerate, uh, re, uh, engage with a local water wheel um, on the, on the Wandel uh, River. There's only one left out of a hundred. And uh, it used to generate power but uh, the um, the dynamo failed about 20 years ago and we're in the process of actually um, uh, revitalizing that generating power hopefully by the end of the next uh, end of summer it will be up and running and the other bits uh, I would like to say is that among our volunteers I see the sense of people trying to um, actually do projects that they've had ideas about for months, years, maybe decades even. And they've, they've sort of thought about if we could do this in about a year from an idea, then what else could we do? So I'm going to leave that as a thought uh, for all of us here. Um, so do we have any questions? So, uh, yeah, gr maybe the, the, the process is just name and repair cafe and then direct, di direct questions rather than statements or speeches are what we're looking for. Okay. Um, speaking as an elderly bear with relatively little brain, um, there have been so many ideas. Can I please, please implore that the... Uh, the slides be made available in some way, shape, or form. Um, the, um, so what I have been doing, cogitating, is I will be loading the PowerPoints to the website, so you should be able to do that. Why was also cogitating? Because we are live streaming this, and there may be, an, uh, maybe it's the first time we've live streamed, but maybe in the settings behind the live streaming, we'll even be able to record this. So, one way or the other, the PowerPoints will be up. So, uh, I'm not sure who was first, sorry. Um, I'm relatively new to setting up Repair Cafe, but um, I was interested in, um, I can't remember your name, but from Lova, when you were talking about um, actually dismantling items that were not repairable yeah. and separating them out into their raw products. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you could just tell us a bit more about that. Um, do you do that in association with anybody? What's the process as to where they go? We, we actually have an arrangement with, of all things, the Salisbury Recycling Centre, which is um, the community tip, if you like, um, their bins are designed for metals, plastics, and so on. So we just effectively take a, a laptop, for example, and break it down to its plastic parts, electronic parts, and they go in the right bins. Um, something a bit bigger would, would be split into, you know, metal work would be prepared to be taken for metal. Things that we can't, like glass, for example, you can't easily recycle glass. That tends to get put into the general rubbish. We've got an arrangement with, with Wiltshire Council that we're allowed to do that. Normally, you've got to be a bit careful. You can't, you're not supposed to recycle other people's rubbish. So we've got an understanding with Wiltshire Council. The head of Wiltshire Council happens to be our um, councillor, so <laughs> it helps. But that's only because we've made a song and dance about it. And, I, and this is something that I think, as a repair organisation, rather than just cafes, the whole, all of us together. We do need some form, whether it's something like the, the Welsh system that um, Phoebe was talking about, or something in the UK, we do need to get together as a body 
and hit our councillors, hit Parliament, because that's the only way they're going to listen. Even hit the manufacturers. It's the only way they're going to listen. Individual voices, oh yes, thank you very much, we'll get back to you. But if there's a big enough movement, and the way it's going, this is getting bigger and bigger, and we've got clients behind us supporting it. We, sh we should be able to push to do this. So, so quick question, if you are getting more heavily involved in this, are you now a licensed waste carrier? Not yet. It's, it's, uh, it's only the stuff that comes in that we don't take stuff in to recycle, we take stuff in and if we can't repair it, we'll make sure it goes into recycling rather than just going in the bin. That's the point. Because one of the ideas that we'd had was um, for some products, um, the issue you've got, especially we, we deal with a huge amount of electricals, um, and uh, sometimes it's about cabling, transformers, um, those, those elements. So I don't know, do, do people keep those? We were wondering whether to actually make ourselves a resource for saying, okay, if you've got cables lying around, um, that you've had from electrical, electronic equipment um, or transformers to say, bring them in because we may well be able to use those for somebody else who walks through the door if we're, we're needing, that they, they, they've lost the power source or it's not functioning. Yes, that, that we, we do do. And we, um, we, some things like USB power supplies and the matching leads, particularly for some of the older things, yes, we will store those and if people want them for a small donation, help yourself. We also have people called donations. It's saving them going to the tip, but we'll get an out-of-date computer, for example. So in that case, we, you, can't, you can't easily, you've got to make sure that the data is clean on it before it's recycled. So the disk it ends up being me doing it mostly, but sits on a machine and just gets wiped clean. Before okay, it for time, time. Do we have time, another, time. Is, there, is there an additional point on to that? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say quickly about items that can't be repaired. So we partner with the Shared Waste Partnership um, in Cambridgeshire, and uh, so repair cafes can request what's called pink bins. Um, so that's a ca so it's a sort of Cambridgeshire initiative. But I think it's really important that we learn from each other, sort of what's working in different areas, and then lobby for that across the board. So the way so at the moment within Cambridge, there's pink bins where you can. Uh, so there's skips uh, at various sites across Cambridge where you can put your electrical items. But what they've done for us is that they also have smaller pink kind of, um, you know, a bit like the size of a, a normal recycling bin. And our repair cafes can then book that and, and that will get delivered to the venue on the day and then picked up afterwards. Um, so that's a great thing to lobby for. Yeah, I mean, it, like, one of all of us, is a decision about how far you want to go and what the volunteers are prepared to do. So there's always, you know, I guess behind this, it's, uh, for example, in Farnham, we've, we've had all sorts of discussions of what we might do, but we've honed in on a very specific model, and that's fine. And, and, but I think that's particularly for the new, newer repair cafe, it's been really clear how far you want to go, what capacity you have, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I know there was a question in the middle there somewhere, or if there's another, I see if that ha uh, is a small hand gone up here, and then there's one over there in the corner. Yeah, for this lady. Yeah. Hi, I am Judy Valentine from Hailing Island. Um, so I've got a couple of questions, so I'll have to just stick to one. <laughs> um, I want. To, um, Hailing Island is quite a thriving community. We've got uh, a shoe repairer, a sewing shop, um, a, a hardware shop, computer repair shop, and uh, tool repairers. So, how do you um, different? How do you separate that out so that you're not taking work away from professionals? So we really see what we do as being part of building this uh, kind of appetite for repair and, and that, that kind of cultural shift. So 
I don't think at all that it's either or. Um, we, it's so important to promote those businesses. Uh, when that happens in our, our communities, we reach out for, to them, we invite them along. Um, with bikes, it's one of the one of one thing that comes up. You know, in Cambridge, it's really flat. Everyone cycles everywhere. Uh, there's loads of bike shops. Um, so uh, some repair cafes take bikes, some don't. I think you have to manage it on a kind of case by case basis. But we also have a, a circular Cambridge directory where we we kind of really promote those businesses. And what we find, because the big thing is that shift to something breaks, and then I'm going to take it to be repaired and with the repair cafe movement is kind of part of that and actually I think acts to promote those businesses rather than kind of undermining them but it's really about working together and promoting those businesses. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that. I think um, the repair cafes come in when something is not commercially viable to be repaired. So. Um, uh, we don't want to tread on the toes. I think uh, I, I took also advice from Ma Martin about it, that we don't want to tread on the toes of local businesses. They are also part of the ecosystem. Uh, but I what we find is uh, we, we get things that are not either practical or commercial to be repaired, and they come to us. So there is, co there is a relatively de uh, good demarcation between the two possibilities. One of the things we've had is actually professionals, as it were, shops referring people to us because they can't do the particular job. So it, it works two ways. No, no, further, further, sorry. No, no, no. Oh. It was. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, um, it was, I think it was somebody first in, well, at the far end, well, sorry. Okay, do I press some buttons? Just speak into it, okay. Thank you. It's my moment. I want to know who is putting together all this data because we've got masses of wonderful data from all the repair cafes and that is that can be used to feed back to consumers that can be used to feed back to the powers that be and manufacturers and has any do we have a software whiz who is working out a way of standardizing our data and putting it all in one place? Well, I, I might answer something, and I think there was something that was set up, and I know James is here, the o Open Repair Alliance, but I think there's been some, some challenges with putting a unified system together. I think Repair Cafe Foundation in the Netherlands has tried to do it. You know, obviously we're at different levels with our sophistication and our desires for the data collection. Uh, some just keep very basic information, some keep very detailed information. So, it, I mean, at least, sorry to chip in, but I'd be interested to hear the panellists' uh, points there. Is it, It's a big, complex issue. You have to, to do this on a UK level. It uh, requires a lot of, uh, would well, a lot of um, investment uh, to do this. Uh, you're getting common data formats, I mean, James has had to try and do this, so I can see he's smiling and nodding. Uh, so, um, so a lot, a good idea, absolutely nice vision for ten years down the line. Uh, if we can, could get a big project, uh, big funding to enable resources to become available to do that, um, that would be great. Um, I guess in, so. So, what we do in Cambridge, so we encourage people to put the data into the. So, it's the restart fixometer goes into the Open Repair Alliance. The the reason for that is um, so it's free. You know, anyone can just sign up and put the data in, and it gets really actively used um, to lobby for the right to repair. Um, and uh, it just seems like a really powerful way to just you know you you put your your repair cafe on the map. Uh, you get your emissions data, you get your your uh, waste data, and and uh, that data gets used so that when someone says you know to to repair a mobile phone, all you need is the screen and the battery, and that constitutes right to repair. Then someone is in the room with the data from the Open Repair Alliance and says, no, there's lots of other reasons why it, why it doesn't. Uh, why it fails and there's all these other spare parts that you need but James over there is the person who's like behind all of that and should 
Yeah. So it's a way to go, I think, is the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the other thing is, if, you've, if a cafe's been established a while, you already have a system in place. Ours is based on Google Sheets, for example. It doesn't follow the full model with, you know, rank and uh, sort of name rank model and what have you. But we can still, we know that electrical items can be repaired or not, and we've got reasons why they can't be repaired. It's not the same detail, but the problem is now, having established, what do we do with the old data? And it's a, it's a big question. So it's, it's, I don't think you're going to answer your question today, but I think as we move forward and get more of these sorts of organization liaisons together, we will come up with a unified model, and then, yeah, it, happily, everyone can use it. So I think the f over the far end was where I think original question. I think there is a lady with curly hair or something. Oh, like that. Hello, I'm Marie Claire from the Chiswick Repair Cafe, along with um, two others here today. Um, it's amazing to hear from you all. I think we're a bit more. We're probably most like the Sutton Repair Cafe. We've been going for less than a year. Um, I wanted to ask you and the others, what kind of organisational format? Uh, do you currently have um, and are you considering changing your format as you grow and expand? Um, because we're in a network we have a, a real mix of different formats of groups within the network. Um, one challenge that we really find is that the balance between constituting and not constituting for a lot of our groups um, we might come on to this later with the insurance question, but we find a lot of insurers have a real problem with allowing a network insurance policy to, to cover constituted groups. We, we are only allowed to cover groups that aren't constituted with our insurance, which is fine. They can then get the insurance, but then they can't have a bank account if they're not constituted. So there's, there's some real challenges there. Um, a couple of ways we found around that, if you're looking for an, an easier route than trying to constitute yourself, is linking up with another existing organisation. If you've got a transition group, a green group, um, Friends of the Earth group, lots and lots of our repair cafes have linked to them to use their bank account, which means they can still access a group insurance policy and have a bank account at the same time. So there are ways around that. Um, if you don't want to go through the full process of constituting, but about 50% of our groups are constituted um, and 50% are then linked to other organisations, if that helps. Do you want to answer what's happening? Yeah. yeah we, well, we, we, we had this uh, same question and uh, we, uh, we decided that we needed to have the minimum level of constitution so that we could, um, so that we could have a bank account and we could have insurance and not to go further into a registered charity because the benefits would be minimal. Uh, and talking to other repair cafes, each one has their own, and each one, uh, it depends on their appetite, it depends on how far they want to go, as Martin says, and, uh, I, and, and one size will not fit all. So I think uh, we learn here about what is the direction of travel, and it might be that if we want and have an appetite for more, uh, or we need to form an alliance where we need to be a registered charity that in the future we will evolve into that. I think uh, the other thing I think is, is again going back to being established four years, the, the, the marketplace if you like has changed in the four years and if we were trying now I think we'd have a, difficult, a much harder job in getting where we are than we did have four years ago. We've got a bank account. We tried to get a um, contactless uh, card facility. Um, so we, one company that we went with and tried, we got this, the sample machine through and then, yes, bank account. Oh, where's your charity number? We haven't got a charity number. Oh, well, we can't give you a, you know, this, this know your client nonsense. So we, we, we couldn't get, so we sum up, yeah, no problem. Sign here, off you go. So don't give up if you get pushed back. But equally, it's not a. It's, it's almost like a not not a level playing field. And should we be a charity? Should we be a community benefit society? There are so many different vehicles that you can use for constitution. Which one suits? I mean, we make a lot of donations to charity. If we go as a charity, we lose a lot of that flexibility as to what we can do with the money. So you've got to be very very careful. And I think on your own, it's going to be hard. I think this, again. 
We need people, people's experience of going for a charity, community benefit, or whatever, and learning what's good for you out of the, the particular model that they've chosen. So in, in talking about the first UK cafe, repair cafe, that was constituted as a charity, it was a challenge because we had to press, set a precedent. We had to even argue what a repair cafe was in our... And, and absolutely, as you're saying, we looked at the different options. Where we got to that was because we did collaborate with, a, uh, with a, an existing NGO, and that didn't work. And so it, we had to step back to say, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to move forward? A series of options. The most painful option in terms of energy spent and, and time to get it sorted out was the charity, but it was the right route. It's a much stable, uh, more stable um, uh, structure. But that's, that, that, as you're saying, I 100% agree, it, it's... With, with what you're all saying is it, you have to sort it out for yourself what is right for you how, how, what are your plans in the future uh, are you going to expand into a broader hub you know, are you just going to be you know, focused on X number of repair sessions a year you know, there's it's, it's some sort of larger issues around, around that um, but, but yeah absolutely important issue so uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions one at the back, and then, uh, well, maybe it's the microphone. Where's the microphone now? Is the here. microphone here. So yeah. maybe if we take it practically, the lady at the back, and then uh, uh, the colleague here, and then we'll close off for, for, uh, for lunch. Thank you. Our cafe operates on Exmoor, which is a very, very rural community. And when we set it up, we were determined not to have it based in one village. We have a lot of elderly people in the southwest. And so we operate on a monthly basis, but across three venues. And one of the difficulties we came up with was trying to get insurance for operating out of three venues. I don't know why this is. I mean, we did eventually find an insurer, but I would really like it if, if anybody's got a solution to this. And I know that, um, if, for instance, in Devon, they've got a CAG, a community action group, which pays for community group insurance. But I wondered if collectively we could all get together and make life a lot easier across rural areas in particular. We don't have public transport, and it's really essential that we try and spread um, the repair service across small communities and small villages. Um, yeah, just to come back to your point on insurance, it's... Uh, a really common challenge for repair cafes insurance. A couple of years ago we did a, a piece of research where we reached out to, I'm sure many of you in the room, groups all across the UK and asked them to tell us what they were paying for their insurance, who they were using and what their stipulations were. And what we found is that even under one insurance company people were paying completely different amounts. Some groups were paying £1,000 just for one repair cafe, other groups were paying £200 for a network of 10 under the same provider with very different stipulations. Some groups had to pat test, other groups didn't, again under the same provider. Um, supposedly Access have a, a standardised policy, I think that's now just been sold to Wessex, um, standardised repair cafe policy. The main challenge that we have found when speaking to groups is that they don't understand what repair cafes do, they don't understand how low risk they are in reality, they hear the word electrical repair and they freak out completely. Um, so what we want to do is rerun that, that piece of research to update it because we know that those challenges have only increased. Um, so we're going to be doing that in the next couple of months but it would be really helpful I guess as a call out now to ask everyone to share that information because what it's useful to do is then to go back to those insurance providers and say you're charging us £1,000, why are you charging that group £200 for the exact same thing? And to start to raise that awareness of, actually, these are very low risk. The, the final question that we ask groups is, have you ever had a claim? We cannot find an example of a claim anywhere in the UK. We reached out to Australia, we reached out to the networks in Belgium, we reached out to the French networks. Nobody's even had a near miss. So the risk we, low is, we know is so low here. And what would be useful is to ask that question again and to see if in the last two years... Still, has there been no claims? I imagine the answer is yes. Um, and we can then go back to the powers that be in the insurance network and, and try and make some progress on this. But um, I guess just to your point, whoever's question it was, sorry, I can't see you. Um, it's, sorry, it's me at the back. Is that um, we're, we can share that all of that information once we've done that research. Um, and we use Access, and they do let you use multiple venues for one repair cafe. Yeah, like we, use, we use Access, but it took well, us some time to find any insurer that would cover three venues. 
Well, thank you. Thanks. That's helpful. So I think, I mean, having well, exactly what uh, Phoebe was saying, having gone through that process, 2013, 14, 15, the first question was exactly as you're saying, such a range of the insurance policies, you know. Uh, but the key thing, the key point is, I think more collectively, and this is where a more collective action could work, it's this perception of risk, on a perception of risk. You know, I, I continued also to have conversations with Martina at Repair Cafe Con uh, Foundation. No claims, you know, and, and I think to actually go around the network and see if anybody has any claims, it's hearsay at the moment. I mean, if, if we could prove that, you know, that would be actually a very powerful piece of information, I'd say. We've had repeat repairs, but not a claim. Right? A repair yeah, no, back saying it's I, I guess making sure, making sure we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Nobody has c claimed back on your repair cafe, you know, and part of the, also maybe why that hasn't happened, because as we all know, that the customers come in hoping to have a repair. So there's a sort of social contract. So if they take it home and there is a problem, they're probably you know, less likely to sue you. There are some, you know, and certainly um, when I, I forget the name of the guy from Cambridge, Chris, I think it was Chris, who is one of the key founders, Cambridge then, which was earlier than I think the broader network, they weren't taking insurance. Now, which was very strange to me. There's also guys in um, Palo Alto, you know, heart of Silicon Valley. They weren't taking insurance. And I, you know, uh, they, they felt that, you know, breaking a claim was extremely unlikely. But I found that extremely odd. Why would you, why would you not take out an insurance policy to claim yourself? So there are still people actively making the decision not to take insurance, which I find extremely odd. So I think we've got one last question, um, and then we'll go to lunch. I, I think you have to I press it right. Exactly. That's OK, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm Malcolm Napier from Maidenhead Repair Cafe, uh, and I'm interested at people taking repairers, taking repairs home, because I, when I registered, I called myself a repair mentor because I understood my role as not being to repair things, but as being to help people repair things for themselves. Now, his first question is, is that correct? Is that, the, is that what my role is, or am I allowed to fix things? Um, we, so I think everyone does things differently. We do it on a bit of a case-by-case -case basis, so um, it's up to the repair cafe volunteer to make that decision to take it home if they want to. Um, don't want to bring us back to insurance again, but that often causes some challenges. <laughs> well, that challenges. was going to be my follow-up question. Yeah, what we is always the say that it's then it then becomes an agreement between the visitor and the volunteer. If it leaves the repair cafe, that's it's their responsibility. It no longer becomes the group's responsibility. The reason we say that is because in the past we've had problems where a volunteer may disappear, they might be ill, they might go on holiday, and the visitor then will turn to the repair cafe and say, where's my item? And we don't want that administrative challenge and that difficulty to fall on the repair cafe it needs to be between the volunteer and the visitor that's how we tend to do it but it's quite a case-by-case -case basis is, is that in the guidance also, for the organizers um, i mean what yes. i'm thinking because uh, I, I think we maybe need to make it clearer to those keen repairers who do take stuff home yeah. and to the person who's handing over the goods that that's what's going on we have it kind of built into our sort of like house rules, the thing the visitor agrees to, to say, if okay. you take this home, that's between you and the volunteer. It is really useful in some situations. Um, we have a volunteer who does a lot of ceramic work and it takes ages and the glue needs to dry. And therefore for him, it's really beneficial to have that option. Where it's maybe not so beneficial is, is where there's more health and safety risk involved. Um, well, I think also if tools that, isn't, you know, if it's a pop-up event, you can't take every tool. Exactly. to the venue and, but you may have the capability to fix it at home so yeah and I mean what what we've both discussed is the higher success rate when you've got more time and more tools yeah, and yeah. you know that's what these shop spaces are showing so there just are some items that is more appropriate to have more resource and more time to do that so is, is, is there is a question that because we had to go back to our insurers to ask uh, particularly on furniture or some of our, which you're, we all recognise, some of our repairs don't want want to let a pro, uh, 
if they've partially fixed it, they've got to take it home to fix the fix it. So that led to us to uh, ask a question of our in insurers, and and our insurers will cover repairs at, at home, uh, uh, in, you know, in a home situation as well. So it's expanded. Well, I, th I think, or, you know, from that point of view, it's caveat emptor. So it's it's the repairers that make their own decisions. Certainly, we don't force anybody to take any repairs home. So I think uh, we have had uh, a situation where one of our repairers did get uh, dementia and had to drop out, but he, that was something he didn't want to drop out. And, and that's real life, because we all know that a lot of, you know, our community of repairers is is 55 60 plus and that's going to happen so i think uh i think that's a slightly different issue uh, but anyway i think we could go on talking and we've got plenty of time to talk about this afternoon i'm sure our tummy is a rumbling and maybe you can show your appreciation to the to the speakers and panelists